Um, I was spending a lot of time in the Dallas Fort Worth area um, working on feedstock efforts for Brightmark uh, before the pandemic. So uh, I can't wait to get back there. And um, uh, hopefully here in the next month or two, um, uh, we'll be able to do that. But um, so thanks everybody for, for joining today and learning a little bit more about, uh, about Brightmark, if you haven't heard about us already. Um, so uh, Brightmark, um, our mission in life is to reimagine waste. And, you know, what does that really mean? I want to get into sort of the details of that. But um, uh, I think that you're going to find when you uh, start looking at our business that, you um, uh, we do some funny things. We, we spend our time uh, trying to solve problems of things that people, uh, you know, people dismiss and things that are a nuisance um, and things that are also big problems like plastic waste, like cow manure and methane. Um, and um, we try to make good business out of it. And in doing so, we try to reduce um, uh, our global carbon footprint and we also um, hope to be able to provide a huge end market for waste plastics so they can get out of our waterways and um, uh, get turned back into eventually useful products like fuels and, uh, and waxes. So um, let me just um, you know, make the statement that we are a very mission-driven organization. Um, all the folks that work within Brightmark um, are similar to me and they have and uh, they love good business, but um, they certainly have uh, an environmental bent. And so, um, you know, uh, we look to create sort of long-term value, and I'll explain what that means in a positive global impact by delivering waste and energy solutions. So um, uh, that seems a bit of a vague statement, but really what it means is that we're developing projects that are, 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 are large projects that require a lot of money to finance them. Um, and therefore, we, um, you know, we want to solve projects for a long term, right? Um, so that means, um, you know, that in the case of plastic, we want to make sure that we're getting lots of plastic feedstock supply for the long term, um, uh, and 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 you know, and getting manure supply agreements for the long term. Um, so our two technologies, I think by now, um, I've sort of introduced you to what these are. So um, we have uh, a plastic renewal technology, and then we have renewable natural gas uh, technologies. So um, we, on the plastic renewal side, I mean, our mission in life, and this is the side of the business that I'm primarily focused on, is where we're taking and transforming plastic waste and cleaning the planet. I mean, it sounds, you know, it, it sounds nice to say that, but I mean, in effect, we're really taking plastics that don't have end markets. There's lots of plastics out there that you're touching every day, whether it's PET, whether it's HDPE product and milk jugs, uh, polypropylene, these have higher values. Um, and there's lots of recyclers out there and there's lots of haulers and, you know, your local municipality might be taking those plastics in and extracting them and selling them for high value. But they're only a piece of it. And only 9% of all plastics that end up in these streams are actually getting recycled. And we want all the rest. Um, and we want to make sure that all the rest of those are not going to landfill. Um, so our technology effectively converts plastic waste and converts it today for our first project into ultra low sulfur diesel um, and into naphtha blend stocks um, and also into wax. And so um, when we talk about naphtha, um, this is really where the circularity conversation begins. And um, I'm gonna come back to naphtha and what that means to circularity in a little bit. Our other technology is renewable natural gas where we're producing clean energy through cow manure and cow poop. Um, so it's kind of a joke around our office is that you know, I spend my time solve, you know, signing contracts for waste plastic. Um, that's going to landfill and other people are signing manure contracts. And that's what we get excited about in our office. So how many poop contracts did you get? How many waste plastic contracts did you get? So um, it's kind of fun when that's the subject matter. Um, so renewable natural gas, just in case, for, you know, for those who don't, aren't familiar with it, it's, it's essentially natural gas, but it's produced from organic waste. Organic can either be, in the case of what we do, um, uh, can be from dairy farms. Uh, and um, we're also involved in organic waste that comes back from, um, uh, you know, from, you know, your traditional residues and the, all the organics that go into the, uh, to the recycling pool. Um, so anaerobic digestion is the technology that captures biogas and it cleans and upgrades and compresses it into RNG and it injects it into a pipeline. 
everything on the new renewable gas side that we do is um, this is sort of known um, uh, technology. But on the plastic side, this is our proprietary technology. So um, we own um, uh, we own uh, a proprietary uh, pyrolysis process, um, and they're not all created equal. Which, and ours allows us to be able to convert all of these waste plastics back into hydrocarbons and then into these other uh, end products that we do today. Cindy, should I just keep rolling? Should I stop? Nope, go right ahead. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right. So I'm just going to kind of detail a little bit on um, the plastic problem and really kind of how the technology works and what it is that we do. So, I mean, we've talked about this already, right? The 9% of, you know, uh, the 33 million tons of plastic that's manufactured every year in the United States, you know, gets recycled. So um, a significant portion, even a larger portion gets incinerated. Um, so when we talk about uh, the sustainability hierarchy, um, you know, I should have a slide here on the sustainability hierarchy, but, you know, there's mechanical recycling, which is where you're taking these resins that I talked about before, like polypropylene, like, like PET, like HDPE, and you're able to basically um, uh, take those resins and, um, and very clean resins, and you're able to convert them immediately back into available feedstocks for plastic suppliers. That's great. And, you know, we love that. And we, you know, that's, that, that is not a market where we intend to compete at all. Um, but it's right below the mechanical recycling on the sustainability pyramid, where there's a massive gap, because down here on the bottom, you have landfill, you have incineration, and then you have waste to energy. Um, we are not waste to energy per se. Waste to energy is where you're producing electrons um, and you're combusting these plastics. So they are end of life and they are producing an electron. We are um, keeping the monomers in play for an extended life in the form of fuels, which gets an additional use, but then also in terms of the naphtha that we can produce um, into more plastics and is going back into creating more plastics. And that is the circular pathway that we talk about. So um, that's why I think um, I probably should add a sustainability pyramid to this slide because I end up talking to it. Hey, Tom, I have a really quick question. I want to jump in here. If you could clarify for us or explain to us when you guys use the word feedstock, is that the word that you're using right in your yes. lingo? plastic in in our world in our world because you're coming from texas and so in my world coming from the panhandle of texas feedstock our grain. cattle in a yeah is related to a group of cattle these are your this is your feedstock so our feedstock if you want to think of us as cattle i guess our feedstock for our pyrolysis system is waste plastic Okay. So thank, thank that is our, that is our grain in that analogy. Okay. Perfect. Um, and when we talk about, I'm sorry, I, I should have defined that term earlier, but okay. um, feedstock and anaerobic digestion for us is cow poop and manure, and it's also the organics that are going into your green bar, you know, your green bin every day, um, and it's also all the plastics that you're putting in your recycling bin every day. Those are our feedstocks. Okay. That, Perfect. Thank you very much. That, does that clarify? That's an important clarification. All right. Um, all right. This is going on about the global plastic producer, uh, plastic production, um, and it's just increasing, you know, and so, of course, we can see where all of these trends are going, right? That plastic is, is, is not going away, but we can still solve the problem. And, you know, that is really where Brightmark wants to be able to come in and make a significant impact. Um, and by creating an end market, we create a vacuum for um, all of these materials that otherwise are being dismissed, right? And are being thrown away. If you knew, you know, it's like the bottle program. If you knew you were getting money for a glass bottle, you know, it would find its way back to, um, you know, recycling. Similarly, we need to be able to do the same with plastics. So our, our plastic renewal technology, the whole design is around, you know, diverting all of those plastics from landfills and reducing greenhouse gases at the same time. Um, so here's how the here's how the process works, and here's what we do. So the first step is we need to identify the waste plastic feedstock, um, and we need to be able to uh, get our hands on that. So how do we do that? Well, basically, half of the plastics in the country come from 
uh, MSW, municipal solid waste. So it's stuff that's coming from all of us. So it's stuff that we touch every day. It's stuff that we put in our blue bins every, every day. So pardon me, that side comes from MSW. Then on the whole industrial side, significant amount of post-industrial scrap material are plastic feedstocks that we can use as well. So we spend a lot of our time working on MSW and working with um, MRF operators and uh, making sure that we're creating end markets for those plastics. And then on the post-industrial side, we spend a lot of time working with you know, big brand owners um, uh, and large producers and large industrials uh, who have lots of plastic scrap material and have a hard time finding end markets. So all of this plastic comes into our facility. So we, we get all these bales of material, we take it, we grind it up, then we remove the metals and then we put it through optical sorters. Um, and when we do the optical sorters, um, uh, we, um, we, we then remove things like the PET and PVC and some of the, some of the bad actors that we don't necessarily want in our process. Um, and then we take that and we grind it down more and convert it back into a, a pellet. So that pellet then goes into um, our pyrolysis vessel and our pyrolysis vessel, imagine it's a giant nuclear submarine looking thing <laughs> and it's heated. Um, and then as it heats up, it's in an oxygen starved environment. And so uh, an anaerobic environment. And then, you know, all that evaporation comes through. We cool that evaporation and uh, out comes ultimately the hydrocarbon extraction of those liquids. And so that hydrocarbon extraction that we're getting from um, specific plastics is now then able to get refined. We go to that next step of doing the refinement. Okay, so we take that cooled vapor, um, we, can, we turn that hydrocarbon liquid and we process it into commercial grade ulfur, low sulfur, diesel, uh, naphtha uh, and wax. So the benefits of this process are that we can take single stream. So we can take all these commingled plastics. You know, what we've seen in the past is there's been a lot of issues of being able to get those commingled plastics. Uh, sorry, of being able to get um, uh, separated streams of plastics and certain technologies have focused just on certain streams. Oh, I just want the PET. Oh, I just want the HDPE. So in these different types of plastics, we can take them all. And so that, that provides a significant amount of flexibility in the market um, and, and allows more feedstocks to be able to come to us. Um, we obviously wanna make sure in, in doing that, that you know, there's no plastics left behind, right? So you know, we can take different types of children's toys, we can take um, pre-surgical medical waste, um, all this kind of stuff. So um, you know, we, a lot of us spend our time saying, how do we focus on getting plastic out of the environment um, which is which is part of the solution, um, but at the same time, um, the market needs to realize now that technologies are now here to be able to take those plastics and deal with them. And I think about specifically on like plastic bag bands. We love plastic bags. <laughs> plastic bags are great for us, right? They're great feedstock. So um, we can take them. Straws are great. We can take straws all day, right? So um, uh, it's just um, it's just there's a gap between um, you know understanding what technologies can accept these materials uh, and and really um, the education of what can go into the bin. Um, and so um, so that's a complicated piece of this process um, that we're, we're we're working to change. So in doing all of this, you know we're able to you know when we do life cycle analysis and what that basically shows is okay how much carbon Brightmark have you been able to get. Um, uh, you know, out of the, um, out of these end products relative to, um, you know, you know, virgin, you know, vir virgin comparatives, meaning, you know, the, a virgin, a virgin ultra low sulfur diesel, a virgin naphtha uh, and, and waxes and so on. And, you know, um, you know, we've just conducted uh, a life cycle analysis, which I think is, is higher than what you see here, but um, in general, it's about a 14% um, reduction. That doesn't seem like a lot, but when you talk about the volumes of plastics that are going into landfill, um, it's a really, really significant number. Um, and as we start doing more circularity with the naphtha, um, this number is just gonna increase.
So here's the here's the plastic resins that we can uh, that we can accept. Um, and um, uh, these may or may not be familiar with some of you, but there's really, you know, there's ultimately really sort of seven plastics that can be identified with plastic codes. Um, the ones that we like most are number two, high density uh, polyethylene. So that's like uh, packaging detergent bottles, bleach, milk containers, hair products, that kind of thing. Um, number three, we don't love, but we don't see too much of it. So we try to sort it out, but this is in, you know, it's most commonly found in, you know, piping, uh, you know, sheathing for um, sheathing for wires, uh, some toys, some furnitures. Um, uh, and that's generally pretty hard to recycle, but we pick it out. Um, uh, but it's, it's usually a low percentage. Uh, low density polyethylene plastic bags is a perfect example. It's wrapping grocery bags, sandwich bags. We love that stuff. Um, and so I want to talk about this in a, in a moment. Um, uh, just about the impact um, that this has. Right now, I live in a county here in California. I mean, a bunch of hippies, we all wanna be recycling the best we can. But even here, we aren't taking the films. And so every day I'm sitting here and I'm taking, you know, the rule of thumb here is, you know, if you can scrunch it in your hand, it's gotta go into the garbage. So it's going to landfill. And I'm here working for Breitmark. And I'm like, this is so incredibly frustrating. I'm like, this is great feedstock for my process. So. We are working very closely with Dow and Reynolds to be able to put programs in place and put programs into the communities to be able to offer a bag, which we call an energy bag. Don't love the name, but that's the name. So there's an energy bag program where these plastic bags are given a very definitive, you know, it's a very definitive color. It's like an orange bag. You can't miss it. So anytime you have these difficult to recycle plastics, you simply put all of those into that bag. That bag, you then just drop it in your same um, uh, blue, uh, your same blue bin, and it goes off to the MRF operator. The MRF operator then takes the orange bag, throws it over here, and it doesn't go into their system because it's the plastic bags that wreak havoc on the MRF systems. It gets caught and it messes up the machinery. So that's primarily the reason why they don't want it. Um, but by source separating it and having the, you know, having us as residential users separating it is creating a significant, you know, significant change um, so that MRF operators are now capture it. It'll get into the recycling stream and not go straight to landfill. So that's just a real, um, that's a real game changing program um, that, um, that we're really bullish about. Um, polypropylene, um, you know, bottles, tubs, ropes, polystyrene, styrofoam, um, you know, these are things that have long been a nuisance, you know, I mean, even here people are like, oh, you can't put the peanuts, you know, the, the uh, you know, the styrofoam peanuts in the garbage, we can take all that, you know, so there's a real disconnect between, which is, which causes a lot of frustration, I think, um, you know, even I'm giving my own example as a, you know, somebody who wants to recycle more, um, it's just, we can accept this stuff and we need to be able to get the message out to enough recyclers to say, hey, put better systems in place to capture more of these plastics so they're not going to landfill, they're not ending up in the waterways and capture them and send them, you know, and send them through to this end market, send it to Brightmark, right? So that's, that's the challenge we find ourselves in. Um, other things of our system, which makes our system very flexible are the fact that we can handle some moisture, we can take some contamination, um, uh, we need to make, you know, keep moisture relatively low. Um, but a lot of other systems that have failed in the past just couldn't deal with some of the moisture issues. And look, I mean, you know, the films that we all touch, I mean, you might be taking a piece of plastic film off of a microwave container or just, you know, opening a thing of hummus and, you know, it's got some hummus on it and it's like, okay, well, do I have to throw this in the garbage? No. So in general, the contamination levels fall below this 8%. And so it's really something that we, um, you know, that we can accept. So um, things are changing. Uh, things are changing there. So um, I put this slide on here and I know for this audience, this might seem a little odd that I'm talking about something that's located in Ashley, Indiana, as opposed to something that's in Fort Worth or something like that. But what this site is that we have, and we had to be able to prove our technology worked. And um, so we financed the very first um, uh, facility of its kind globally. And I'm not trying to sound grandiose. I'm just saying this is the largest plastic renewal facility in the world. And it's only doing 100,000 tons per year. That's a lot of tonnage, but there's so much more waste out there, right? So there's just so much opportunity. 
Um, so that project today is producing ultra low sulfur diesel, naphtha and wax. And you've heard me say that already. Um, but as we go forward, we're really focusing in on that naphtha component and being able to take that and, you know, uh, uh, then use that as a feedstock for creating future plastic resins. Now we need to work with the resin manufacturers to be able to do that um, uh, because those are huge capital projects that are outside of our scope. Um, but really this is the, the key message here is that Brightmark is able to create the largest pathway um, uh, to be able to actually recycle plastics back into plastics because we have so much scale, we can take so much material, we can produce so much naphtha that we're making a significant, you know, we can take a significant imprint um, and, uh, you know, and, and increase circularity. I think some of these numbers, I mean, I can talk about these numbers, but there, there's no frame of reference here. So they're just sort of like numbers. Um, uh, we do have uh, projects that we're developing um, in the Southeast and in Texas, um, this was supposed to bring up, oh no, here we go. Um, okay, so um, it was supposed to bring up Texas next, but anyways, um, so we are developing actually three facilities this year. So in the, in, uh, in the Southeast, uh, in the Gulf Coast region, um, we're hoping it's gonna be in Texas, uh, but it may be, might ultimately end up in Louisiana, but it'll certainly be within an area where those feedstocks um, certainly can come to us. Um, so um, uh, just a couple highlights here, sorry. Oh, uh, sorry, I just had a puppy jump up and bite my, um, bite my cord here. Um, so, oh, and I think she actually, in the course of doing that, changed the slide, there you go. Um, so our next facilities um, are going to be able to obviously create a significant amount of jobs. Um, the economic investment alone and job creation in Ashley alone were 100 jobs. Um, the economic investment alone in Ashley was about 260 million. So these are large projects. This isn't like building a MRF. This is like building, you know, um, a large sort of uh, energy scale asset. Um, uh, and in the process of doing that, we're going to be offsetting 152 million metric tons of greenhouse gases a year. Um, so um, I, do have, um, I do have a slide which I think kind of helps to sort of tell a story for, um, for where we're headed in terms of the hub locations. But these are generally the areas that we're focused on. Ashley, Indiana... Uh, I didn't know where it was until, <laughs> until I started with Brightmark. Most people don't. It's a tiny little town, um, but it's located in northern uh, Indiana. And so it's kind of right in the middle of uh, the Midwest. So, um, you know, between Chicago, Detroit, um, Indianapolis. So it kind of sits right in the middle there. Um, we're developing a project right now in, um, uh, in the Southeast. And as I mentioned, uh, another one here uh, in, the, uh, in the Gulf Coast region. So uh, I do have a um, I do have a video um, that I can show, um, and it's about a six or seven minute video, uh, Cindy, which I'd love to show, which just shows the Brightmark story. Um, the only concern I have is that it may not be able to um, uh, the audio may not work. So I want to give it a shot, and if it works, great. Um, but it really does an incredible job of explaining uh, really at kind of like, you know, an individual level, the impact of, of what we're doing. Okay. That's great. Um, Let's give it a try. And, and it's called, uh, and it's called kids, uh, kids explain bright marks. Good. Uh, I love that video. Okay. I'm glad you're going to try to share that. It's really cool. Good. Okay. Okay. Oh, so you've seen it already. All right. Oh, yes. cool. I've done my research. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I like it. Okay. So let me see if I can, let me see if I can pull this off and if I okay. can, great. Um, but I love this video and um, I don't want to sound corny, but um, Rick, the guy whose kids are the star of this, this, uh, this video are um, really cute. Um, they they're, are. More, they're more pop. They're, he's our chief engineer and um, they're, they're more popular than he is now. So um Okay, so let me see if I can't um, share my screen and I hope I can share my video and show this to you. Okay, can you see this video yeah, start? Uh -huh. So you, yeah, you can see the kids. 
Okay, now let's hope for the audio. Yeah. Did you get that? My name is Jude. No, no. Let me see. It's like we've got closed captioning going. Um, darn, she's got a really cute voice too. Let me um, let me just see about my sharing. Um, video settings. Yeah, it's kind of tough um, to share video for some reason, and I don't know why that is. Usually it gives me the option to Yeah, there share. is a setting somewhere. Uh, are you in YouTube? Uh, this one's in Vimeo. Oh. Um, yeah. But um, usually when I hit share screen, let me try it one more time. Okay, that's fine. Usually when I try share screen, ah, share sound. Okay. Ingenious. Perfect. Let's try this one more time. Okay. And let's, okay. Let me know if you hear it now. My name is Jude. Perfect. Yes. That's a pretty cute voice, right? Okay. Let's go for it. Let's, <laughs> let's, okay. I'm seven years old. Wow. I know a lot about dinosaurs. I know all their names. Brachiosaurus, Brontosaurus. Um, sometimes I forget. Wow. So our family is probably uh, larger than average. <laughs> we have uh, five kids. It's a lot of kids. Like most families, we use a lot of plastic. Tupperware, toys, car seats, packaging, so much packaging. It's everywhere. By the time I'm my dad's age, like in 30 years, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. It makes me feel bad. I don't really want plastic to be a little place. If there's no plastic in the ocean, then fish, you can find plastic in your food. We used to wonder what plastics we can and couldn't recycle um, until we moved to Ashley, Indiana, and my husband started work at Brightmark. My daddy works at Brightmark. He's an engineer, and today, so my daddy works. So uh, my kids have still not seen where I work, and actually most people haven't, because we just finished building it. Okay guys, why don't you use a plastic toy that we can take with us, and uh, we'll put it in there so we can turn it back into oil, all right? So Ashley, uh, it's a very small town, and uh, up till now, it may be the most famous for having a big, bright, yellow, smiley face water tower. But now it has the largest and most high-tech plastics renewal facility in the entire world. I've never been to my dad's work before. You know, I talk to them a little bit about what I'm doing at work, but it's uh, kind of hard to convey the scale. I thought it was really big, all of the, the giant machines, and I saw plastic get turned back into oil. I learned that plastic comes from oil. It may from plants that existed before dinosaurs. Way. It takes a ton of energy. Tons and tons. And then people just throw it away like a stress. But it's not. And it's actually a way to turn plastic back into oil. Right Mark can take all plastic away. Plastic toys and dinosaurs, drawers and styrofoam, you name it, even like plants. We're able to accept all kinds of plastic that is commingled. It doesn't sound like a big deal, but uh, it's a game changer. So my sister brought a Lego board with Legos on it, and my brother brought a Lego dino, and I brought a real toy dino. They put it on a conveyor belt. First, it went low, then it started going up, 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 and into the grinder, and it chopped up my dinosaur and it grinded it up. But it's okay, because it's not a real dinosaur. <laughs> it's just toys. And then it goes through this fancy thing that has a roll up laser eyes. And it can tell if the wrong bit of plastic is there, and shoots it right out of the box. It's a near-infrared sorter because it has a special eye and it can see if it's stuff that we don't want. Because there's a little eye, a special eye, and if it saw something that wasn't plastic, it would shoot it out with an energy. So, uh, yeah, it shoots out the other plastic, you know, out of the, out of the stream, and uh, it's fun to watch. And the white plastic is to get chopped up more peaceful, and it goes into the metal drum and they open it up and it got 
about to see inside, and there were lots of little holes, and that's where all that plastic gets crushed into these teeny tiny little pellets that had lots of color. There was this big tube, they were just rain pellets. And then it makes a big hill of all that stuff. There were tons of pellets. Tons and tons of the whole hill. The pellets were kind of like rabbit poops. <laughs> I got to climb the hill. It felt like kind of climbing a mountain. I didn't do very much because I have holes in my shoes. The pellets get put into giant steel vessels that uh, they're airtight. We heat it up and it goes through a process that we've perfected called pyrolysis. Pyrolysis? <laughs> I think it's a pyrolysis. Pyrolysis. Wow. I heated all those pellets up really hot. Now it's a crackle, crackle. And there's no air in there, so the plastic doesn't burn. Which is important because then no yucky, toxic stuff gets put into the air. And all the plastic turns into gas. And it gets clogged in all these tubes and stuff. And then it's more super secret sciencey stuff. That makes really cool sounds like blah, blah, blah. Bloop, 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 bloop. And then the plastic turns back into oil. And I can make whatever they want from it. Fuel and wax. And eventually they're going to turn it back into plastic. We're still working on that. It's pretty hard. We're working to take this waste plastic and turn it all the way into to clean new plastic to go fully circular. Yeah, that's pretty cool. My dad's work has like super top secret patterns. You can't even tell me about it. Sometimes it cries too, but I don't understand any of this stuff. So we have a patented process that makes this three times more efficient than other pyrolysis processes. This is the biggest thing of its kind in the world, for sure. They could take 100,000 tons of plastic a year and turn it into 18 million gallons of fuel that can pull trucks and other things and six million gallons of wax that can make candles and stuff. And it probably costs 260 gazillion dollars, which is a lot. Uh, this is the world's largest plastic renewal facility. We have plans to expand worldwide, and our next ones are going to be even bigger, up to four to eight times bigger. That's really exciting. It's going to change the world. I think it's cool because you can turn garbage into real things by putting a chest and recycle it. So if you have a broken toy, you can throw it in recycle it, and it will come back into a different kind of toy, which is important because then we keep plastic from going into landfills, incinerators, and our oceans, reducing greenhouse gas, which will help us from going extinct, like the dinosaurs. My dad is actually a chemical engineer as well. I got to go into work with my dad on occasion. It wasn't that often, but uh, I always remembered the experiences that I had. You know, I care about what the world's gonna be like when they grow up. We realize here at Brightmark that, you know, we still need to reduce our reliance on single-use plastic. You know, it's, it's everywhere. But uh, also there's high quality plastics that at some point they're gonna be discarded and uh, something needs to be done about that. I am optimistic about the future. You know, these are problems, but they're problems that we can solve. Our future will depend on the mark you make. Let's make it right. Okay, thanks for indulging me in that. It's a bit long. It really does a great job of yeah. explaining um, our process better than I can. <laughs> so well, and and it comes from a, a kind of a perspective that a lot of us would come from um, learning about your industry and your in your um, company. So I, I was glad that you were able to share that. It's very helpful. Right. Um, okay. Do you have time for a few more questions? For a few. Questions? I, I I do. I'm just getting moved to a different area of my house here, so. Uh, but I think I'm situated, so hopefully I don't lose my <laughs> my connection here. Okay. Okay. So we have several questions. Um, we have a very thoughtful um, resident that submitted his questions early, and so I'm going to um, I'm going to read them to you, um, uh, Tom. So. Do you, are you um, familiar with the different um, types of uh, plastic recycling methods? So he's asking about 
and you mentioned mechanical. So he says, um, what are the comparisons, pros and cons of the plastic, different types of plastic um, recycling methods? Mechanical gasification, pyrolysis, depolymerization, solvent-based. And after processing, what are the rates for these um, um, for virgin-like quality granulates and resin? So I am assuming he's asking, uh, are yeah, he says, what are the processing rates for these? Are you familiar with all of these different types of recycling methods? We 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 are. Um, I think he's asking a very technical question. Yes. Um, so I'll try the best I can to answer it this way. Um, mechanical recycling is where you're doing a low melt point and you're being able to take the product and, and, and make it reusable very instantaneously. And it has to be very clean and it has to be separated. Uh, what we're doing is we're actually um, uh, you know, we're breaking, uh, we're breaking these, um, plastics back into their chemical constituents, which are primarily hydrocarbons. Okay. Uh, and then that evaporation, then, you know, there's a, there's a heating process and that ev evaporation then, uh, ultimately yields a liquid, a liquid hydrocarbon that we can then turn into products. Um, uh, the difference between um, some of the other forms, incineration, I think I alluded to this before, incineration um, is where you're effectively burning it at a really, really high temperature, mm -hmm. and therefore you're creating it, and it's being mixed with other, um, other feedstocks at the same time, and you, in doing so, you create um, volatile, volatile compounds, and uh, so our, our process creates absolutely no toxicity whatsoever. Okay. Um, so the, the byproduct of our process can go into, uh, into waste. Now, some of, um, some of the other technology that, that, that are, some of the other technologies that are being referred to um, are interesting. Um, I don't know how effective, I, I've seen some of these other ones. Um, uh, sorry, I mean, there's a term there. It was kind of like a, a dissolved, there's a sort of, I can't remember the name of that technology. But nonetheless, I mean, we've seen some of the polystyrenes being able to get dissolved down mm -hmm. and then worked with that way. Um, these single stream uh, technologies are great. They're, it's just hard to get the feedstocks. Like if you're only going out to get styrofoam, you know, okay. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it limits your availability to get some of those feedstocks. Um, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's more difficult to necessarily achieve scale. So okay. from a business standpoint, um, you know, I think pyrolysis has has some positive attributes that way. I see. Okay, and that basically answers his his second his second question. So um, the last question is says plastic waste is a huge issue, and um, closing the plastic cycle is greatly needed if the goal for our country and the globe is to reduce plastic emissions that lead to our lead to or promote global warming. How do you respond to the statement? that advanced chemical recycling can only be sustainable by relying on a steady supply of plastic waste, which an incentive, uh, which gives an incentive to manufacturers and consumers to not reduce the use of plastics in the first place. Hmm, that one's a tough one. Um, look, uh, you know, I, I think the way that we look at it, if if we run out of feedstock, we've done our job. I mean, I don't know how to say that any other way. There, you know, we're we're here to be able to promote the circularity of the product so that virgin feedstocks and those additional greenhouse grasses don't have to be consumed. We can't solve all the problems of uh, of whether consumers, uh, you know, how much they're using plastics, how much they're in, um, you know, in other goods. We work closely with sustainability people. Often cases, the, the folks that we're, we're working on are both sustainable or focused on the sustainability of the materials that like the scrap materials. That are, and then they're also focused on how do I use less plastics or, you know, um, how do I, how do I get away from this so that I don't need to produce more plastics? Mm -hmm. So, um, it's a great question, um, but I think that I think when you think about the question itself, it's like, you know, we're trying to solve the problem um, uh, of what's out there today. We're not trying to solve the problem um, of, of what goes into the products that we create today. And um, look, if we had no plastic waste, 
Brightmark would close our doors and we'd be happy because we're mission oriented. So <laughs> that's the only thing I could right. say. Um, okay, so um, Mr. Guckel asked a question about the, uh, the, the numbers on the bottom in the triangle on the bottom of plastics. And I think you answered that question with one of your slides. Basically, you guys, you accept all plastics, right? And so the numbers, you accept all, all types, right? That's the whole point of the single stream conversation, right? We, we do. And, and, and I would say primarily from the municipal solid waste. So that's the whole like end user side of the, you know, the, the, the feedstock pool. Um, you know, yes. I mean, we're taking almost all those one through sevens when it's post-industrial, there's some more kind of bad actors in there, mm -hmm. meaning like there's, you know, fire retardants and there's, you know, a lot more chlorines and, mm -hmm. you know, some more vinyls and stuff that we need to be on the lookout. So yeah. um, I would say the one through seven statement is more of a consumer facing statement. When we're talking to people who understand plastics and molecules from industrial product and industrial scrap, and they actually have the data that's in their product, um, there's certain things there that we just, you know, they're not plastics. It's they're, 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 um, you know, they're, they're, co they're um, uh, co-extruded product mixed with plastics that we can't accept. Right. That you can't use. Um, so, um, so yeah. Um, Kirsten wants to know how efficient is the process, the pyrolysis process. It seems that the recycling process you describe is fairly energy heavy. Uh, it's surprisingly not. I think when we talk about um, uh, our um, the efficiency of our process, I think we're 94%, 90 to 94% efficient. And what that, what that means is that um, that 6% or 10% that doesn't yield the hydrocarbon liquid is something we call solid inert residue. And so that's all the fillers that are mixed in with the plastics mm -hmm. that don't evaporate and they come out and they're solid and mm -hmm. that solid inert residue. And this is a very important point is that that solid inert residue, the way that we process it, um, uh, it's non-toxic. And so we never achieve these temperatures where we're getting um, volatile compounds and, and producing a product. So that solid and inert residue that we get at the end of our product mm -hmm. is uh, it can go in regular landfill. It doesn't have to go into any sort of hazmat process or anything like that. I mean, it's not, it's not toxic. Okay. Uh, Lori asks, is the diesel that you make through pyrolysis uh, considered a renewable diesel? Um, I think this is kind of semantics, this area, if you want to put these terms on it, we call our process is called plastics renewal. Um, it used to be called chemical recycling. Um, and so, you know, we could argue that, um, you know, we are renewing or keeping the hydrocarbons in play as opposed to letting that energy go straight into the landfill. Um, when I think of the terms renewable, um, you know, I don't directly apply it to the plastics, though it is a form of renewal. I tend to think of the term renewable uh, as something that applies to, you know, um, uh, organics, you know, um, and maybe that side of our business. So I, I don't know that uh, I don't know that it has that actual designation, um, but um, you know, it is it is diesel that has gone through. Uh, a recycled uh, technology process and has been renewed. <laughs> so I'm sorry, it's just such a bad way to answer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we but have I, I just don't know, like the capital renewable <laughs> and what, it, you know, does that fit into some, you know, um, government term? I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't know enough to answer that one. Okay. Um, so John uh, Rath, I, I'm going to some of your questions have been answered in, in uh, Tom's conversation. I'm also, I'm just going to ask what has gone unanswered as far as I can tell. Um, how do you arrive at a 14% greenhouse gas reduction? Does that uh, consider the initial GHG from production? Um, wow, these, these questions, these are telling you. I told you we were small but mighty. 
These are, <laughs> these are good questions. These are hard questions. I mean, you're basically asking me about what's the basis of the life cycle analysis that drives the 14% reduction. Um, well, first of all, I would say um, there is there is some energy that's involved in our process, but um, uh, um, a lot of the natural gas and the heat that comes through our process is closed looped. In other words, we're utilizing all of those gases and all of the um, byproduct gases that come from our process go right back into our system and are used for are used for heating. Um, uh, can I pinpoint exactly where those GHG, those 14% reductions come from versus virgin? Um, you know, um, gosh, I wouldn't want to shoot from the hip and answer that one. Um, but, you know, these life cycle analysis are available, like the ACC has a full life cycle analysis on advanced recycling, which is what we're called advanced recycling and plastic mm -hmm. renewal, um, uh, where they've done the full deep dive on that. But um, uh, yeah, I wish, I don't know. I, I, wish I, I wish I could tackle that one in a better way. We, we understand. Um, it's a great question though. Do you it's a key question, and and I would say that there's there's further runway for us improving on those GHG emissions and that life cycle analysis as we go more circular. And there's aspects of our process that can be improved, right? I mean, we can take renewable energy uh, as that form of uh, you know as the form of production. So there's things that we can do. We're going to get better. We're going to work. I mean, you know, we have, you know, we have goals, internal goals to improve the life cycle analysis because it's fundamental to what we do. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's all I could say there. So uh, Tommy mentioned uh, you guys are, are, we talked about the different types of plastics, obviously. And do you have a preference? Do you have a preference for what is the best? We really love this kind of plastic. We prefer to really get our hands yes. to this at feedstock. Yes. We love, I would go back to, so of the plastics, we love number two, we love HDPE. So milk jugs and all that kind of stuff. We love LDPE. We love plastic films. Films are everywhere. We mm -hmm. love plastic films. Mm -hmm. We love polypropylene and we love polystyrene. Um, so we love twos, fours, fives, and sixes. And why is wax part of the output? How, how did, how did, is that just the natural? I mean, you guys, you came up with the, the process and, and we're like, well, it turned into wax. I mean, how, how does this come about? I mean, you guys are Texans. Aren't you guys taught about hydrocarbon uh, refineries in high school? I mean, this is like, the, this is like hydrocarbon. No, but look, I, I, I don't, I don't, I know. I, I don't come from this background. Um, but um, the, the, the way that the, the, the pyrolysis oil and the mixture of hydrocarbons gets fractionated. And so what we do is we're able to separate the naphtha cut, which is kind of like the sweet crude, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then there's a medium cut. And then this is just, an, and, then, and then there's a, there's a heavier cut of those hydrocarbons. That is basically the wax. Um, so there's, there, there are, there are chemical limitations of what you can do with that hydrocarbon chain. Mm -hmm. You're always going to end up with some waxes. You can think of the waxes as a residue, but they're a super useful product, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we could go make more crayons. We could mm -hmm. go, uh, you know, we can make candles. We can make, uh, food grade waxes that, you know, line our paper products. I mean, you know, so, I mean, waxes are ubiquitous. So, um, you know, you can argue that wax is, is circular as a product in, in its own right. Mm -hmm. Kelly has a great question. How, how do you get the recycled products to the plant in Indiana? Is, is there a rail station that's built or truck? Is it trucked in or, or, you know, I was interested too. I mean, you, you have, you would ideally have plants in different regions of the United States and, and what's the best, you know, what, how do the items that right now, I guess, get in, get to the, the plant in Indiana? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's largely truck, um, truck and intermodal, um, is, is how we're receiving, um, today. Um, you know, we're investigating rail, rail, rail is really helpful when you're like, you know, like a six to eight, you know, drive or more away. So you gotta be like 400 miles or something greater, mm -hmm. um, for rail to start making sense. Um, uh, so 
that that's kind of the challenge. So when you're moving feedstocks that far, it sort of begs the question, well, why don't you have a hub closer? So we're, we're, we're continually trying to think of, okay, let's build our hubs and put them in, you know, the right locations. And then let's do densification in those areas. So mm -hmm. let's go gather those feedstocks, process them and potentially pelletize them or even pyrolyze them remotely. And then we can bring them down into where a hub location is there. So there's a lot of complexity. I never thought it would be that complicated, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of complexity in, in developing the right hub and spoke model. Transport is the most brutal part of this industry is because just, I mean, it just adds so much cost. Right. And um, what, we have, what we have seen in the, since the pandemic started it's a really bizarre phenomena where we saw oil prices um, come off significantly, you know, um, uh, you know, WTI dropped to serious lows. And then um, usually truck pricing comes down, mm -hmm. but it didn't. And truck pricing has just sort of increased. I guess we're, you know, ordering more packages, you know, mm -hmm. we're keeping trucks on the road. Um, some people had um, unemployment, um, COVID unemployment benefits that, um, you know, um, said, Hey, I'll just stay at home then going back to drive my truck, you know, so for whatever, you know, I, I don't know what all those reasons are, but there's been a very odd, um, situation where it's, where it's decoupled itself from WTI the past year. So let's hope that trend ends and we can get back to some normal prices. Yeah. Um, Kelly asked, what are your suggestions for local consumers that want to recycle plastic bags, but the recycling plant or the state swear, we live might not want those in the bin. Um, so w one of our Walmarts used to taste the plastic bags, but they don't take them anymore. Yeah, that's a bummer. I mean, look, I mean, th this is this is the side of like recycling activism that, um, you know, we, we all feel like we have to do. Um, and it comes at, it, it sort of, it sort of has to be a two pronged approach. We have to come at it with making sure that um, uh, that municipalities and that those who are ultimately governing um, what goes into the bin know that the technology exists to force it to go into the bin say no -uh, you know because the re the recyclers the 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 murphs and the recyclers i mean they <laughs> they want to, you know, they're in the business to make money. They don't want to take materials that they also then have to necessarily landfill. Right. So, you know, they, they look at things like plastic films and plastic bags, right? Um, and they say, hey, this stuff creates havoc on my equipment. I don't want this stuff. It's costly. I'm having to shut down. Mm -hmm. So get these bags out of here. Right. So that's why, you know, we've talked about the energy bag program, you know, things like that, some activism around energy bag, and I can certainly get you guys plugged into energy bag in a heartbeat, um, would love to do that. That is a great program. So Keep Cobb Beautiful in Atlanta uh, is one of the uh, five public, uh, pilot um, sites. Idaho has one. Um, there's one in, um, uh, goodness, where are the other two? Um, anyways, I can't remember, but we're always looking for, uh, for, for new municipalities to get involved in this. And, you know, it's really as simple as just telling the MRF operator, like, look, you're going to get more materials in, but it's not going to wreak havoc on your equipment. It's getting all the constituents and all the residents are more excited because now they know that they're putting more plastics, um, and diverting them from landfill. So that's just really kind of, uh, you know, that's really kind of a beautiful program. But the only other way is to make sure that, um, you know, you keep your, um, you know, all the um, sustainability folks and the solid waste administrators educated of like, hey, these technologies exist. Mm -hmm. And it's not like, it, it's not like, you know, we're, we're paying for these materials. We're going to actually pay for these plastics. Mm -hmm. That's a total we're totally upending the calculus. You know, right. if you want to send these materials today to incineration, you're going to be paying $150, $200 a ton. We're going to pay you 30 bucks a ton for these materials, which hopefully is just going to cover the cost of you shipping it to us. Yeah, that's, so, that was my question. So for the energy bag program, if the MRF uh, takes, the, takes the bag, throws it aside, what, what becomes of the stack of energy bags? You know what I'm saying? I mean, so somebody is responsible for grabbing those and putting trucking them to you the correct that's how that would work that's right dow at this point dow and reynolds who are running that program are in charge of that and okay. and they're and they're subsidizing that for now mm. um so um so that's why it's a really cool program because they're gonna they're gonna cover the cost of that i mean at the end of the day 
Reynolds wants to sell bags. Yes. They want to sell gar you know, they want to sell energy bags. Right. Um, uh, so, um, so it, it's a really kind of unique opportunity and Cobb County in Atlanta, I'd be more than happy to introduce you to, um, the administrator over there. Her name's Kimberly White. Um, and she's just full of energy and she's been working on this thing for four years and she's mm. got it working and it's working yeah. and it's producing good feedstocks. Um, and, uh, it's exciting program. So yeah. that will be one idea. Um, you know, but I'd love to see all those plastics at least getting in the bin for now. And then, you know, to the question that somebody else asked, yeah, I'd love to see more sustainable packaging as well, but mm -hmm. can't do it all. <laughs> right. Um, and here's another technical question for you, Tom. What are the energy costs per 1,000 gallons of diesel fuel? What are the energy costs? I'm not sure I understand that question. Uh, how, much, uh, how much does uh, energy is used to create 1,000 gallons of diesel fuel? I think that's what he's asking. 14% less than virgin would be my answer. Um, Grapevine does not currently, no, Grapevine is currently not um, associated with Brightmark. Um, we, I, I began to research uh, innovative companies across the United States that were doing this type of thing. And um, Tom and his colleagues spoke at the State of Texas Alliance for Recycling Conference in the summer. And um, I was just was very interested in what, what they're doing. And I, and I wanted um, our residents to be able to see the opportunities that are out there because I don't want us to always feel like, well, we're just inundated with all this plastic, what's gonna become of all of it? And so I just wanted all of us residents and attendees to be able to know that there are some options and th some things that are in the works. So, um, what the closest to us, um, the closest MRF uh, that that uses Brightmark services, uh, Tom. I mean, are, are you? So, the so we're work, we're working on it, and we're in the development stages now. And what that means, development means getting a site, mm -hmm. and um, and and getting a site. Um, we uh, we had a site outside of Houston. We even had our air permit, and I think for um, for 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 reasons that I can't discuss you know, we, we've changed our think about where we need to be located. And mm -hmm. so we're going to choose a different site, but we're almost there. Mm -hmm. So once, once that, once that is identified, that puts in the, the, that puts in the motion of us being able to get feedstocks and to get um, MRF operators and to get different municipalities on board to say, okay, this technology is coming mm -hmm. and we need to be able to get the education mm -hmm put out there in the market to say that these materials can go in the bin and do a bit of a rethink in terms of where we're at um, so that we can get more materials diverted to Brightmark. Um, and it, it comes from all angles. It comes from, from you guys. It comes from us. Um, it comes from the MRF operators. It comes from things like the energy bag program. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's just, you know, it's kind of all hands on deck, but I, we, we need to take the lead in terms of making the announcement and then getting people all excited about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Well, um, Tom, I really appreciate your time. I know that that everybody um, has super busy schedules and we, we know that yours is as well. And um, we uh, appreciate you spending time with us and helping educate us and we are encouraged and, and I thank you um, for joining us tonight. Well, thank you. I appreciate your passion. I appreciate these incredibly difficult questions. I mean, there's really some tough questions there. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, again, I'd love to follow up on some of the things that we discussed, Cindy, uh, on the energy bag stuff. That would be great. And um, uh, I really appreciate um, you inviting me and um, helping me get the message out. Good. Thanks a lot, Tom. Attendees, thank you for joining us tonight. I know that um, you guys came away um, more educated, just like I did. I hope you will plan on joining us in August for our next uh, lecture. Um, look for a brand new Keep Great Mind Beautiful website um, launching in the next month or two. So we're really, really excited about that. Um, also, uh, I'll be sending out the link uh, tomorrow for our survey feedback. And uh, I hope that you'll take a few minutes to fill, fill that survey out. Um, again, thanks uh, for everybody joining us, and I hope you have a great rest of the evening. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Cindy. Bye.